we're going to be looking at a, a, the topic of, of faith this evening, actually. Um, and uh, we'll, we will be reading a, a few different passages. Um, I say a few different passages, but uh, we will be we will certainly not be lacking in, in references when it comes to the aspect of faith. And faith, the funny thing about faith is faith tends to be a, a, an enigma. Um, and it, when I say an enigma, it's a mystery. Um, it's it's uh, it has this this cloud of unknown around the topic of faith. And the funny thing is, is when you go up to someone and you say, "Hey, hey brother Bill, how do you define faith?" and and brother Bill would probably give us the the most extravagant definition that we'd ever hear. And then we'd move to the next person, and then the next person, and the next person. We'd get different definitions, and and it's kind of hard to to pin down. The, uh, what faith is, and, and especially with the aspect of, of talking about uh, growing this morning, growing in Christ, uh, Christ wants us, Christ wants us to grow in faith. Um, faith is, is not so much an action, but a, a lifestyle, a, a heart attitude. And uh, we're going to look um, at faith, and, and uh, we're going to be reading uh, actually a lot of different passages, and um, I, I think this morning, or I think I had about seven pages of notes this morning that I went through. Um, this is going to be, this is nine pages. I'm not planning on reading all of it. I've got a lot of extra in here, uh, just depending on how the Lord leads and wants me to talk about. Uh, there's a few things in here that I'm already planning on, on kind of skipping over. But there's a, what I'm saying is there's a lot to be discussed when we start talking about faith. And, and it's, it's so crucial. Um, in fact, if, if you ever plan to, to live a life that would please God on any level, faith has to be the foundation of your relationship. It really does. Um, but we'll go ahead and, and get in the passage, and um, we'll, uh, uh, we'll kind of, well, actually, we'll read the passage and then kind of get in the, the, the sermon, the message. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1, and we'll read up to 9, it says this. This second epistle, beloved, I, know, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is one of the most powerful passages that we find in the New Testament. It goes from it goes all the way back to the beginning of creation and talks about the, the hope that we have in Christ of him fulfilling the um, well, I mean the, the latter in the latter days and whatnot. But the one thing about faith is that if you don't have faith you have no reason to believe any of this. If you don't have faith, this is just mumbo jumbo. It makes no sense. In fact, he he, un, he kind of talks about faith in 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 a, in a sense. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. So the funny thing is, is even in that moment, they're they're talking about faith, because a man without faith is going to say, Ah, oh, God doesn't fulfill His promises. He can't be trusted. He's failed me so many a times. But a man or a woman with faith 
will read this passage and be encouraged. They'll, they'll, they'll believe and trust God when he says that he spoke all of this into existence. That this, all of this that we see in this universe is not by mere accident, but is there by design. Faith is so vitally important in our lives as Christians. Faith is not simply, uh, faith is not a simple accomplishment to be worn and displayed. Faith is not a single step to be taken, but a vessel in which we travel through the seas of the Christian life. Faith is a foundation that you can't, you can't skimp on, you can't skip. If we have not faith, there's no point to remember anything that the Bible says. If we have not faith, the voices of the prophets might as well have been silenced. If we have not faith, the epistles write to us in vain. If we have not faith, the naysayers will drain out and mute out all the voices in the Bible. If we have not faith, there is no reward but only disappointment before God. If we have not faith, there is no point to listening to God. And if we have no faith, there is no hope. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for what you've done for us. Lord, I thank you for the fact that you've saved us. And Lord, after we, we have accepted salvation, we have uh, become born again. And, and Lord, that uh, we receive Jesus Christ as our, our one and only Savior. Lord, you don't leave us to just wander around and to wonder what this all means. But Lord, there is, there is a part that we have to do in all of this, and that's to trust you. And Lord, I pray that we will live lives that are always increasing in faith. Lord, I, I pray that none of us ever reach the pinnacle of, of faith, because Lord, there is no pinnacle for us in faith. Lord, we are to continuously trust everything that you say and promise to us. And Lord, I pray that we are faithful in doing so. Lord, again, I just thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus Christ's precious name I pray. Amen. See if I can keep my iPad from locking on me all, on, on me all the time. Um, faith is, is such... I love talking about faith and and I love talking about the passages where men and women have exhibited such great faith. And it's kind of funny how you can, you in the Bible, you can find people that like, yeah, man, he was an apostle. Of course he had faith. I mean, it's expected that he'd do something crazy like Peter walking on the water or uh, uh, Thomas actually declaring that he wants to die with Jesus Christ and, and all of these different things that the apostles did. But the funny thing is, is there's actually men and women that were the the least and the 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 least expected to do anything, and God used them. And it's so amazing that that it doesn't matter who we are, what we've done, and and what we're capable or incapable of doing. Faith is something that will unlock the ability of, of having those those miraculous moments that God has in store for us. Hebrews 11, which if you were to declare any chapter in the book of or in uh, the the Bible itself it, it, to be the faith chapter, Hebrews 11 is the chapter of faith. Hebrews 11, 1 through six tells us this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should, be, uh, he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. 
But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Good night. And that's just the first six verses. You've got, I think there's like 40 or 50 something odd verses in this chapter. And it just gets better and better and better. But the aim of, of this time that we're going to spend tonight is, is to apply these principles to increase our faith. And to step out to attempt great things for God. Because we're not going to attempt anything for God if we don't have faith. We are saved by faith in Christ as Savior when, believing that he paid in full for all our sins and wants to save us. He then calls on, uh, we then call on Christ to be our Savior. Um, Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. John chapter 1 and 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And as believers, we must continue to walk in faith day by day. We don't have faith just in the aspect of salvation, but we are to have faith in every aspect of our life. We walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. But of course, it leads us to a couple of questions. What do we have faith in? What do we have faith in? See, the thing is, is everyone has faith in something. If someone says, I don't have faith in God, I don't believe God, well, there's something that they do believe. Everyone does. Whether that be themselves, a, a plethora of small G gods, Maybe they believe and have faith in science. And that's what we see a lot of a lot today. And honestly, it's not science that we see a lot of today. Is a lot of students, college students, have faith in academia. It doesn't matter what the, the college professors say, those professors to them are God. Because whatever they declare is truth. Um, and that's how a lot of a lot of college students treat it. I've seen it myself. We need to have faith in the right thing. That's what's important. Not not saying that you can't trust people, and I'm not saying that professors don't uh, have a, a great knowledge or something of the sort like that. But the sad thing is, is there's a lot of people have that have an ultimate faith in the wrong thing. We have to have faith in God's promises in the Bible that they are true and reliable. God can be counted on to do what is best and right for us according to the goodness of his character and his loving purpose for us. Genesis 18.25 says this, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And you think about it, God will do what's right. He always has and always will. So why do we sometimes forget that? Why do we sometimes put our faith in other, other things? And I'm not saying that we do it on purpose, that we do it in spite against God, but you know, sometimes we can accidentally, without realizing it, you know, we can accidentally put our faith in the wrong thing. So we have to keep that in check at all times. But how important is it to walk by faith? That's another question we have to ask ourselves. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to, what, please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Um, I will be honest, this is something that I realized in Bible college, and and I had heard that voice many, or that, that verse many times. And a lot of people, they quote the very beginning of Hebrews 11, 6, don't they? They say, uh, oh, wow, now I can't quote it all of a sudden. I've said it so many times in my life. And what Hebrews 11, 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. And everyone quotes that. I've heard so many sermons just on that one part. 
of Hebrews 11.6, but the sad thing is, is we sell the Bible short by not telling the whole verse. Because to have faith, and if you were to try and defining faith, I hope I'm not getting ahead of myself because I think I have a definition here. Yeah, I have a, I have a, I have a definition here, but I, I like to define it this way also. If you were to define faith, it is trusting God and believing that He'll reward you. And it's it's this, uh, it's this two sides to a coin. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is. Okay? You have to believe that God is all powerful, that God has the abilities that he declares that he is, that he has. You have to trust him on that. You have to believe him. There's no way that you can test it. It's not like you have a handy dandy God measure, like some ruler or something. You don't have a device that does that. It's kind of like some people ask me with HVAC and AC. They're like, well, how dirty is my air? I'm like, I don't know. There's no device out there that I can just go, do 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 Yes, you have this many particulates and dust in your air. There's nothing that exists to, to measure that because there, it's unmeasurable. There's no way of doing it. And it's the same way with God. There is no way to measure God. So what do you have to do? Trust him. When he says that he is all-powerful, what is he? All-powerful. If he says that he's omniscient, you have to believe that he's every omniscient. Yeah, omnipresent. I'm thinking of omnipresent. He's everywhere. Omniscient meaning all knowledgeable. You have to trust him at these things. But it's a little easier said than done, isn't it? So first of all, with uh, Hebrews 11, 6, you have, to, you, you have to believe him when he declares who he is, but also that it says, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That was something that always tied me up growing up. I, I had a lot of self-esteem issues, and, and, and I trust that God was who he said he was. That was easy. That's easy. Because I'm, I'm, I'm a no one. Uh, yeah, well, God says he's that. Well, obviously, he is. But the one thing that I had a hard time growing up, and I realized this in Bible college when I read this verse, and I, was, I was like, good grief. I've had it wrong this whole time. I didn't trust him to fulfill his promises. And I realized at that time when I was in Bible college as a sophomore, I think it was, when I was reading this passage and I was studying it, and it wasn't some sermon, it wasn't a, some Bible study, it was just me spending time with God and his word. And, and the Lord said, hey, Sam, you've got this wrong. You've had it wrong this whole time. Yes, I'm God. But can't you, can't you trust me to fulfill the promises that I've given you? And I had that, I had it struggled with that. And that's where I, I began to grow in faith. That's where I began to grow in faith and begin to trust God so much more. That's why it's important to have faith. Your relationship will be hindered immensely if you can't trust Him when He says that He is who He is. And if you can't take him at his word in the aspect of the promises that he he's given you, given us all, then we're lacking in faith. Hebrews 11.2 says, For by it the elders obtained a good report. Did they, were, did they obtain a good report because of the things they sacrificed? Because of the things they did? The things they said? No. It's because they believed God. The funny thing is, is when you read all of the Old Testament, you, you read about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The funny thing is, is God did a miracle in their life and transformed their life when they believed God. Not that they, they obeyed God, but they believed Him. They trusted Him. Faith is truly a, a key to open up the, the power that God has for you in your own life. Now, of course, we have another question we have to ask ourselves. How will having faith or trust in God affect my life? Well, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of things that we could talk about. I mean, good grief, we're talking about every single person in the Bible displayed faith or doubt, and it greatly affected their lives, didn't it? So, if we are to uh, trust God, how will it affect us? 
I, if I have faith in God, I will not worry, but live in victory. Oh, man, that is good. That's good. I think of, of, of uh, what is it, Joshua? Good grief, Joshua. The 12 spies that get sent, sent out, Joshua and Caleb were the two spies that said, hey, God's given us the land. Caleb even says, give me that mountain. But what do the 10 other spies do? They say, oh, Oh, man, and the funny thing is, I was reading this recently. Um, there's a young lady that I'm, I'm talking with, we're dating and, and whatnot. Um, and we do Bible study every night. We read the Bible together um, over the phone or over voice, or the video chat and that kind of stuff. And it was funny because I pointed it out to her recently, and we just had a really an awesome discussion about it. But it's funny because when the ten spies, they argued with Joshua and Caleb, they said, no, we can't go in there. Because we look like grasshoppers. They actually said, we look like grasshoppers in our own eyes. So they must see us as grasshoppers. They let their, what is it, uh, what do you want to call it? The, uh, their uh, uh, insecurities. They let their insecurities hinder them from claiming Canaan. And they ended up dying because of it, never seeing the promise. They didn't trust God's promise. Kind of like the same thing I was doing for many years. I believed God that he is who he said he was, but I didn't trust him in the promises that he gave me. I was making the same mistake the Israelites were making. So I will not worry but live in victory. I will attempt more service for God. I will pray more, expecting answers from God. That's another good one. I will sin less, knowing that sin is due to mistrusting God's power to solve my problems. Well, we can go throughout the whole Old Testament and find all kinds of, of situations. And I'm thinking of like Abraham uh, waiting for God to give him the seed. And Sarah just says, well, I'm not having any kids. Here's my maid. And Abraham says, okay. And they have a they they because of that mistake, that sin that they, they did, they still have a nation that terrorizes Israel today, to this time, because of that moment that they did not trust God. They what they uh, mistrust God's power to solve that problem to because they were getting they were past that time of being able, or getting close to that time of not being able to have children and whatnot. I will wait patiently for God to work out His plans in my life as I focus on serving Him. I will tell more people about Christ, believing that God's Word will not return void, but will accomplish that which He purposes. Which we see in uh, Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but I shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Charles Spurgeon says this, A little faith will bring your soul to heaven. A great faith will bring heaven to your soul. So how do we define faith? Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But here's the thing. Substance, uh, another word of describing substance is assurance, and, and hoped is what you expect for, uh, expect, and evidence is that conviction. Uh, so, in a sense, Hebrews 11.1 1 is a way of saying, now faith is the uh, assurance of things expected for the conviction of things not seen. I have a lot of convictions. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to keep from chasing rabbits because I've already chased a few of them tonight. It is a confident assurance that God will do what is right and best for us in what we hope and pray for. Let me add that God does not do what makes us happy. Okay, God's ultimate goal is not our comfort and pleasure, but His glory and pleasure. That's something that we as, as Christians today in our society make a grave mistake. We think that God's ultimate purpose for his existence is to make me happy. No, it's not that. 
we make that terrible mistake and we see that with churches today and how churches are going completely bonkers. They, they, and that's the thing, they want to shape the church around what the world wants instead of what Christ has paid the church to be. The world does not own the church. The church does not belong to people. We are the church. And we are a bride to Christ who has paid for us. We sang that song, and that, oh man, I'm, I'm going to try not to get t- distracted and whatnot. So much to be said about this topic. Now, here are some Bible examples of great faith, and we won't get too far in, uh, we won't get too far in explaining everything, and I'm just going to hit highlights. But the thing is, is you can, you can go through so many people in the Bible and just inspect their lives, and you'll see faith that, come, that comes through. Noah prepared an ark for the, sa- the saving of his house, even though he had never seen rain. Abraham left Ur at God's command, not knowing where he went. Abraham, by faith, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. And you know what's funny about that is Abraham, at that point in history, no one had ever been raised from the dead. That was a concept in his imagination. And God... Uh, he trusted God to do the unimagin- uh, like the unimaginable. Ah, there's so much to be said about that. Joseph kept himself from adultery with Potiphar's wife. Joseph stayed faithful to God in the dungeon jail with no knowledge as to whether he would ever be released. And he also had a great attitude through, a whole, through the whole thing. Moses refused to be called the son of pa- uh, Pharaoh's daughter. And there's, I mean, there's a list of different things that Moses did in faith. Joshua, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Rahab, Rahab, a harlot of a country, a nation, a people that God promised to destroy and wipe off the face of the earth. Rahab, a harlot, received the spies with peace, risking her life. And God preserved her and her family. In fact, Rahab is part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Rahab is actually the mother of my favorite character in the Bible. Gideon, with God and 300 men, defeated 135,000 Midianites. David, by faith, faced Goliath, killing him with one stone. Elijah prayed for God to withhold rain for 31, uh, what is it, two years? 31 days and then two years. I'm trying to remember the story. Then prayed for rain. Job endured suffering, yet he sinned not with his mouth, nor charged God foolishly. Hezekiah, by faith, promoted a revival. Nehemiah, by faith, returned to Jerusalem to rebuild his walls. He faced great danger and opposition. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel preached God's message to the Jews who persecuted them, persecuted their own. Daniel prayed to God daily, knowing that he would be thrown to the lions. And the, the, I, the, the list goes on and on. And if you want to find even more people, read Hebrews 11. It gets to the point where Hebrews 11 is just like, I, I, can't, I, I can't even name everyone. I, there's not enough time. Hudson Taylor, the famous missionary, first went to China. It was in a, sail, it was in a sailing vessel very close to the shore of some cannibal's island that the ship was becalmed and it was slowly drifting shoreward, unable to move. This, this ship that, that Hudson Taylor was on was just slowly, just kind of like it lost its, its momentum and, and, and the current had stopped and there was no wind. There was nothing to move them forward. And, and they just found that their ship was slowly creeping towards the island of cannibals. And the, the cannibals are all standing there waiting. They're just enjoying this great feast coming to them. 
The savages were eagerly anticipating a feast. The captain came to Mr. Taylor and besought him to pray for the help of God. I will, said Taylor, provided you set your sails to catch the breeze. Now this, this doesn't make any sense because there was no wind. The captain, no doubt, gave him a confused look of like, what are you talking about? The captain declined to make himself a laughingstock by unfurling in a dead calm. Taylor said, I will not undertake to pray for the vessel unless you will prepare the sails. Oh man, that captain's probably sweating. Whoo, man, he's getting nervous. The captain agreed to Taylor's requ request. While engaged in prayer, there was a knock at the door of the stateroom. Who is there? The captain's voice responded, Are you still praying for wind? Yes. Well, said the captain, you'd better stop praying for we have more wind than we can imagine that we can manage. But of course, what are barriers to our faith? What are barriers to our faith? Kind of like we talked about the hindrances to our growth as Christians. What are the barriers of our faith? Sacrifice when you think you'll lose out on some thing. That's one reason you won't have faith. That's one thing that's held me back from having faith. That's something that holds us all back from having faith. Is, well, if I do that, I'm, I'm, I just, I'm going to put myself in a situation where I'm going to miss out on something. That will keep you from having faith reasoning in your mind when God's commands seem unreasonable. Oh, God, you really don't understand what you're asking of me, okay? I can't do that. That's a lack of faith. Peer pressure, which is a very common thing. I will find that in the Bible time and time again. When obedience means going against the crowd. I can think of Peter. Christ told him, you'll deny me thrice. You'll deny me thrice. Oh, no, what are you talking about? No, I won't. What did he do? Because of peer pressure, he denied three times. Not once, not twice, and thought about it the third time. No, he outright denied Christ three times to the point where he cursed him. Peer pressure is a dangerous thing. But also one that's another uh, a hard one is suffering. When obedience and having faith is likely to bring you suffering. There will be times when that will happen. So how do we increase in our faith? How do we increase in our faith? Hearing the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. As we hear God's word at church, study it privately and believe God's promises to be true, our faith will increase. We must hear, read, study, memorize, meditate on God's word. Remember God's past answers to prayer. David strengthened his faith before he fought Goliath by remembering how God delivered him from what? from the paw, the lion, and the bear. Notice Saul's lack of faith compared with David's great faith. God's past victories encourage us to attempt great things for God today and to trust Him in the future. Of course, we need to obey God in what you know already. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Luke 16.10, if you don't do faithfully the little jobs that God has given you to do today, you won't do faithfully the bigger jobs that God may ask of you later in life. Ask, for, uh, ask God for great things daily. You will receive what you ask if you ask in Jesus' name according to his will. John 16.24 says, Hitherto have ye, also, uh, have ye asked nothing in my name, Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Ask in faith for wisdom, nothing doubting. James 1, 5 through 7 says this, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and give it to all, that giveth to God, give, give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed, 
For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Ask God to give you a mighty impact on the world for Christ, because he will. Listen to the Holy Spirit's leading. Philip did this in Acts 8, 26-31, resulting in an Ethiopian eunuch being saved. As we listen to the Holy Spirit's leading, we become more used of God. Others are blessed. God is glorified, and we are encouraged to attempt more things for God. Of course, by meditating on God's goodness of character uh, in the Bible. Notice how God loves us. He wants to bless us and lead us in the right way. I won't read it because it's a long passage I have in here, but Psalms 34 is a phenomenal passage, uh, a phenomenal chapter, a phenomenal psalm to, to read um, when it comes to that. Um, I will read this one verse, Psalms 37, 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Uh, Romans 8, 28 says this, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. It doesn't matter what mistake we make. It doesn't matter what we lack. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. If you are called of God, if you are a Christian and and you are dedicated to, to do something for God. And that doesn't have to be some, some great missionary. It, it can be the, the simplest thing that God has called you to do. If you are surrendered to it and you have faith, God will accomplish good out of it. What about Joseph? He was, he was uh, so many scandals were around him and he was thrown and hated. And, and even his own brethren, his own father and mother scorned him. Everything was working against him, but because he had a dream from God and he trusted God and had faith in God, God did what? Preserved Israel and his family through it. That's the type of faith that we need to have. That knowing that no matter what the situation, as long as I'm just following after what God wants me to do, it'll all work out. By trusting in the Lord rather than fearing what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. As David said in Psalm 56, 3, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, Job said in 121, when the devil took everything that he had. Job continued to trust God even though he lost his wealth, health, and children, and his wife. Oh man, don't get me started on his wife. Oh boy. I think he, he described it pretty well. You, he answered as the silly women do. <laughs> oh, man. You can read book after book of missionaries in history. We also need to develop a thankful attitude. Thanking God for all things. Knowing that God is working out His perfect will in our lives. In everything, give thanks as it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. I've got, I've got about 9, 10 more points that I can make right now. There's so many things that we can do to increase our faith. But we've got to make sure that we're not letting something hang us up. We got to make sure that we understand what faith is. We have to understand who God is and the fact that the promises that you've read through the Bible, all of them are true. You can trust them. You can take it to the bank as the saying goes. But what's the conclusion? What it comes down to is, will you increase in faith? Will you? God doesn't give us a promise that we will because it's our decision. It's our choice. But will we? Will you apply these principles today? Because they're applicable to every moment of the day. And it reminds me of a little boy. I love this. It reminds me of a little boy. He kept going to church and the church was going through a terrible drought and it was in a farming community. So the church would get together and they were just getting they were just more and more desperate. The crops were dying and things just weren't looking good. And you're talking about tons of people going into debt that they wouldn't be able to get themselves out of. 
We're talking about a, com a community itself, a town just lapsing in and disappearing off the face of the earth. And this church would start gathering every night, and they would have a prayer service. We need rain, Lord. We need rain. We need rain. We need rain. And day after day, and week after week, and month after month, they'd keep on praying. And the, the little boy was coming, and then he started bringing an umbrella, and everyone just looked at him funny. What are you doing? Until the Lord finally answered, and that boy was prepared because he had true faith. They all knew who God was. They knew that if they needed something, they needed to go to Him. But that little boy was the one that believed that God was going to answer that prayer. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. My favorite verse when it comes to faith is it's something that's transformed my life itself. Hebrews 11.6, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. It doesn't stop there. Remember, that verse does not stop there. It continues on to say, For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Obviously, you're here at church on a Sunday night. You could, we all could find things to do. I'm kid grief. I'd, if I could, I'd go sleep for the next 12 hours. I, I work hard throughout the week, up in hot attics and all that kind of stuff, and the rain sometimes. Whoo, man! I could sleep 24 hours every weekend. I can find things, good things to do. But we are here because we know who God is. But I hope that we believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for what you've done for us today. Lord, I just thank you for uh, Lord, just everything that you've done. Lord, I look back on my life and, and Lord, even, even as a teenager, Lord, ah, my life was projected to be somewhere completely else. If it wasn't for you intervening, Lord, if it wasn't for you doing something miraculous in my life, and, and Lord, getting my attention, and Lord, I just thank you for the fact that I was in Monterey, Mexico, uh, back in July 17th in 2007, and it was at that moment I, I was running away from you, and I, and I despised everything in my life, and I hated my family at that point. Lord, I, I didn't trust you, but Lord, it was... July 17th of 2007 that I surrendered my life. I, I learned at that moment what faith was and trusting you when it comes to, to who you say you are. Lord, it still took me many years to, to, to figure out that I needed to, to trust that you were a, a rewarder of them that diligently seek you. And Lord, I, I pray that we don't forget that. Lord, I pray that we will understand what faith is. We don't forget it. It's something that stays on our mind because, Lord, if we forget what faith is and, and why it's important and how to increase and what keeps us back, Lord, if, if we forget all of that, Lord, we won't live a life that's pleasing to you because we'll just live our life trusting in something else, finding something else to have faith in. Lord, you are the thing. You are the person, not the thing, but the person to have faith in above everything else. And Lord, I pray that we won't misplace it. Lord, I pray that we will continue to believe in you, continue to depend on you. Lord, I thank you for the fact that in spite of me, you've been able to do great things. Lord, because honestly, if it was based on my merit, my capabilities and my my earnings, my everything, Lord, I wouldn't be able to accomplish anything, but Lord, Lord, you have so many miracles for us. And Lord, we're never going to see that if we don't have faith. Lord, I pray that every single one of us here will practice faith. That faith will be the attitude of our hearts that will trust you. Lord, again, I just thank you for all that you have done. In Jesus Christ's precious name I pray. Amen.